Reactive Training Systems. Hey everyone, welcome back to the RTS Podcast. I'm Mike Tashir. I've got Paul Steinman here with me today and our guest, I guess, uh, Jake Noel. Um, so in an effort to just kind of start things off uh, with a bang, I guess, um, Jake, who is a movement specialist, yeah. for lack of a better term, um, why don't you start off by just telling us, are the lats actually important for the bench? Uh, and if they are, how important are they? <laughs> yeah. So um, the there's a direct answer to that question, I think, that is that, yes, they are important. But the certainly from the line of work that I perform, most of my job, as you and I have spoken about in the past, is educating people on uh, corresponding principles to things that people are looking for yes or no answers to. What I mean is, are the lots important is yes. Um, how are they important and to whom and in which application and all those sorts of questions become much more layered. But the short and direct pathway is, yeah, they're super duper important. Um, and it comes from the standpoint of um, and something we talked about the difference in bench press versus your squat and your deadlift, the standpoint of how your body stabilizes during the bench press versus how your body stabilizes during the other two primaries. Um, and the, the nature of the actual anatomy of your body um, and how that anatomy impacts the way you press. So let me explain. Uh, the hips, which are the primary central um, loaded unit during the squat and deadlift are fused. So each sides of your hip uh, in embryonic state fuse together and your hips become one thing, the yeah. pelvis, right? right. Um, so you have two hip bones and they merge together and it becomes the pelvis and you have one thing. So that creates an inherent stability. The scapula, the shoulder blades, which is what is the chief stabilizer in a well-patterned bench press, um, are not fused. They have independent movement ability. Um, and so with that said, the scapular region and creating stability in the scapular region requires a soft tissue muscular activation scenario, unlike that is not seen as much in the pelvis. So pelvic stability is, is more easily created via bones. Um, yeah. Scapular stability has to be created via musculature. So with that in mind, um, the lats serve as sort of the platform um, of the bench press. And I have... Um, I would, I would say that calling them quote lats specifically is an understatement of the importance of uh, during bench press. The upper back, the lats, the rotator cuffs, the mid traps, the rhomboids, all of it needs to synchronize to create good stability out of the shoulder blades. The lats have the unique uh, attachment, which is to the, to the arm bone, the humerus. So your upper arm bone has a direct link to your lats. And so when you're trying to stabilize that upper arm bone during a press, uh, the lats are absolutely involved. But I, would, I wouldn't overstate lat stability during a bench press. I would say, um, sure, yeah, absolutely, lats need to be super strong for good benching. So does everything else in your upper back. Yeah. Um, the traps, the, the mid traps, the rhomboids, all the, all the rotator cuffs, obviously. Um, but in fact, scapular stability, upper arm bone stability, all of the stability required out of the bench press... Um, I, in my experience, particularly with an intermediate or beginner lifter, odds are that is super duper underdeveloped um, and that that stability is going to be something that can be very challenging to most people are trying to stabilize their presses with the front of the shoulder. And that's a, an inherent, um, you just have a whole lot less musculature to use, uh, coach. Does that, does that apply? So you're talking about lat stability. You're talking about, does that apply to geared and raw benching? And also does it apply to say a flat back bench versus an arch bench, or what, what do you believe is the optimal? Yeah, so a body arch during bench press is, the, is actually the safest way for the shoulders to bench press large loads. So the, the kind of typical power ben, power lifting bench press where you arch up real big, um, you drive with the hips and the feet, and you use your entire body to press, that is not only the most um, like mechanically advantaged way of doing it, but also the most stable and safest way to bench press large load. So that, to answer the flat back or arch back scenario, um, 
for any competitive lifter to not be focused on create when you arch the when you're arching your spine you're arching the rib cage you're creating a smooth arch from the hip all the way through your body into your shoulder blades and it should create a nice smooth line for you to be able to contract all of that posterior chain musculature all at the same time to create super rad stability and then press a big press flat back is inherently harder because it reduces your capacity to use those muscles to stabilize. So you have to stabilize flat back more. When you lay just flat on the bench and, and you have to stabilize your load, it has to come more out of the pec, it has to come more out of the shoulder. Um, so there you see the flatter pressers. Um, I've seen all the time where they'll beef up those anterior deltoids and get great result from that because most of their stability is coming from there. So you have somebody who's laying relatively flat, they're stabilizing with the front of the shoulders, um, and so by building that area, they're able to press more. Those individuals, when we pattern them over to a good arch, often really wrestle with not being able to use the front shoulder to stabilize very much because in that body mechanic, you really cannot, um, you're disadvantaged in using that musculature. So you have to find your lats, you have to find your rhomboids and your traps. And so those individuals, that's why sometimes when you repattern a bench, you get a 50 pound PR. And sometimes when you repattern it, you, they drop 70 pounds, you know. Um, because if the stability mechanic has been patterned over time to use pecs, anterior delts, and a flat press, um, then there's, you take them out of where they're stronger because they've been trained to be stronger that way, and you see a decrease in strength. Certainly the shirt, now to answer the question about the shirt, a shirt's going to provide a much, and I've done a limited pressing in a shirt um, personally. Because I don't like it. I just think raw is way cooler. Um, because because raw is all about upper back and traps. And um, I think I think I was I think I've heard Jim Windler say, you know, raw pressing is so much cooler because it's all about traps and rear delts, and it just gives you that huge yoke, you know. And that's totally true. Um, yeah, I love it. Yeah. Whereas a shirted press, the 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 reason as you're drawing down into the bubble of your shirted press. Unlike this, the scapular stability is kind of minimized by the tension you're creating on the fabric of the shirt. So you have to squeeze tight when you're shirted and you have to draw your elbows in tight and that creates a much stronger lat, mechan lat based mechanic. Um, and with that, with that said, yeah, lats are super significant for the shirted presser because to get through the bubble of your shirt, you have to squeeze the lats. They're what row you down into the bubble, kind of, if that, sure. if that makes sense. Whereas gravity covers that for you in the raw presser. So it's really about stabilizing the scapula. I've heard some theories about lats for the raw presser um, aiding right off the chest. Yeah. Um, again, I think that's a misassignment of which muscle does that. I yeah. certainly think that if you did the exercises that build the lats, you'd be building the mid traps, you'd be building. So if you go, yeah, I did tons and tons of pull downs and tons and tons of rows, and now my lats are huge and I'm improved my bench press. So bada bing, bada boom, obvious, right? Obviously that's what works. Well, that's true, but you also brought up everything else in the upper back and, and yeah, I, I don't see why um, that wouldn't have an immediate carryover into a raw or shirted presser. However, lat specifically, certainly much more significant for the shirted presser, upper back, um, traps, rhomboids, rear delts, more significant for the um, raw presser. And getting them to all communicate together to create the stability that allows you to fire that, that um, bar off your chest. When, when I, or go ahead, Coach. Yeah. So I guess what I, what I hear you saying is that, I mean, yeah, clearly they're important. Um, now what a lot of people are going to take away from that um, when they listen to this is that that's the most important because there seems to be like this, uh, I mean, it's just a human tendency, I guess, for categorical Absolutes thinking or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. like if they're important, then they're the most important. If they're not the most important, then they're not important right. at all. And I mean, just kind of contrast that a little bit. Like, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty the, sure that you're not going to, uh, weigh like stability musculature over the prime movers, but n well, I might, if that's why you can't, press i there mean if, yeah so go. if yeah i mean if what's costing your press is stability yeah. um then i absolutely am going to identify stabilizers as more important more significant than pecs anterior delts triceps all of it right. um so that is indicative that is categorized by a presser who um wants to bury it into their chest doesn't want to control it down right by the chest um so 
the individual who can bring it three quarters of the way down, and then that last quarter of the press just kind of blink, yeah. poops out. You've seen that, right? Yeah. That's an individual who's not creating the stability in the upper back that they need. And we coach our lifters to touch your shirt, not your chest. Is how, yeah. So I say come down until that bar touches your shirt. Once it once the light's gone, you know, there's no space between the bar and your shirt, press. But you shouldn't really just bury right. things down because that's just going to be an indication that you weren't able to keep your back engaged properly, and that means the scapular mispositioned. It's a nice light touch. Yeah, you're not tra- – yeah, but more than even just as a good idea, you're simply not going to be able to transfer – if you can't keep your back engaged properly, you're not going to be able to transfer force as well. Some of those awesome, the vanilla gor- gorilla press, right, where you bury it down in your tummy and then whoo, fling it up. You know, th- those individuals are creating a mechanic that is different than what I would identify as ideal, even if it's worked great for a couple people. I would say on average, your, your best best bet is to find a way to keep your upper back stabilizing your bar all the way down to the chest uh, should not. In fact, it should just get tighter and tighter and tighter and more uncomfortable the closer the bar gets to your <laughs> chest, up to the point where you're like, I just have to get this bar off off my chest. It's almost like you're creating a kinetic energy similar to a shirt, but you're doing it with your with your own muscles. So, so walk us through if you so to take somebody, they just they took a hand off, they took the bar out of the rack. What's happening is they lower the bar down to their chest, and, and where so where do where if you yeah. can kind of go kind of step yeah what does it feel like properly what does it sure. feel like or or what muscles are firing sure. or, or what's turning on and turning off so before the bar goes down to their chest, so the handoff needs to come out and the bar should feel effectively weightless when it's in the right position. So there should not be a, a you should be positioned such that that bar is kind of resting on the stilts of your arms if that makes sense. It's in good balance. There's low stability demand because things are well aligned. To get that most likely requires a tightening of the shoulder blades, and, you, and we want to roll the shoulder blades together. That's going to be all mid trap, all rhomboids, um, upper back musculature, not associated with the lats yet, not really. From there, I coach my lifters to flex their lats and row the bar down to their their groove, which is usually right at the bottom rib, or like at the bottom of the sternum. Is approximately where most people land, um, and so or upper abs, upper abdominals to there. Okay, so uh, depending on the their mechanics. But with that said, we take we roll the shoulder blades down and back, squeeze them together, and get so that both of those shoulder blades are well positioned on the bench press and evenly flattened against the bench press. So one's not sticking off the side. There's a big. I see that re- regularly. That's going to prevent tightness. So that gets tight. Our rhomboids and traps are engaged and then we're flexing our lats and we're rowing our the bar down to our tummy or upper ab. The closer it gets, and this is also why I don't really advocate for coming down real fast with almost any lift. Um, there's a certain tempo that's good, but I would say come slow with it so you can, what you're trying to improve is what is known as kind of kinetic energy. So yeah, we tell people quick but in control. Yeah, and only as fast as one can maintain great, again, what I call kinetic energy, or what is, is called kinetic energy. Right, as call, you yeah. get better, you can go faster. And maintain that exactly right. For a novice, you're going to probably slow it down so right. you can get a sense of what actually is going on. Absolutely, and exactly, that awareness of proprioception of that mechanic, yep. So with that said, the lats are flexed, and I'm rowing the bar down to my chest. For the beginner and intermediate bench presser, it's a three-second descent, maybe two-second descent. So... Two seconds from the time you break the elbows to the time that that bar touches your your tummy or, or chest. Uh, throughout the entirety of that, the entire objective is to think. I, I, how I visualize it is I see my lats coming to a V down at my hips, and I'm trying to create tension in that V pattern through my lats all the way down to my butt cheeks, all the way down to my pelvis and into my butt cheeks. And there's a connection uh, there. Uh, the soft tissues connect the lats and the glutes. Uh, have a strong connection. So with that said, um, also why, by the way, weak glutes during a bench press can super cost you because you lose the stability of the pelvis. So my glutes are tight. My pelvis is stable. My lats are flexing and engaging down at a V angle um, as my elbows are tucking and the bar is coming down toward my stomach. All of that creates kinetic energy. And that has, uh, Mike, who has trained with me regularly, has seen my lats cramp sometimes uh, yeah. obnoxiously cramped, like <laughs> stop it, you know, right. uh, you know like get, let's get through this part, you know, but, um, and they always cramp down toward the hip because I want to pull my lats with the lowest fibers I possibly can, um, to create as much mechanical stability as I can. The, 
the punchline that I would kind of identify is that the the lats along with the traps and upper back should create you should effectively create a maximal tension there it should be as much tightness as you can achieve again up to cramping right. i mean uh and then from there we you, always tell people like you can never be tight enough like getting stronger is in a lot of ways a process of learning to be tighter right yeah and then allowing that tightness to do the work for you almost you you know you keep it it's Maybe a bit of a side note, but why it's like, you know, a big, big arch in a, in a uh, short bench press stroke. I've heard people go, oh, it's kind of silly. You're kind of, you're just doing that for powerlifting. It's almost cheating. You know, you're not really getting full range of motion strength out of that. You're, you know, my bench stroke is like five inches or something. Right, yeah. It's not very, and I have really long arms. So I've kind of mastered this, this <laughs> just, out, just out of my own necessity. Yeah. Right. Um, but that's not, it's not cheating. It's, Forcing that mechanic is just as physically challenging as moving the barbell. I mean, yeah, it's not, yeah. I think people can often confuse mechanical efficiency with cheating. Yeah. And I think it's just because they're jealous. And we call it, <laughs> <laughs> it's, I would identify, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We call it anatomically advantaged. So yeah, it's not, exactly. if you, if I am able to create an anatomical advantage via my understanding of the anatomy and a great technical approach to my lifts, um, that is skillful approach to a sport. That's yeah. that's good. That's the whole boat. Well, I uh, going back a, a ways. Um, I remember John Bogart told me one time that if you're if you're bench pressing and you're comfortable, then you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that I mean, what you're saying about uh, there being a great amount of effort involved in getting set up and maintaining that mechanic, then yeah, I mean that echoes what great benchers have said for a long time right yeah. and how this how this transfers to or or to i began the conversation with it's different than the squat and the deadlift sure. it's also why you and i have spoken in the past i advocate a lot for lower rep range with bench press even lots and lots of singles because you have to create that stability with soft tissue and stability musculature and as the repetitions increase a lot of times the stability starts to fade and we can create uh, patterning problems there where the last two reps come off with poor stability and we're ri potentially risking injury or else just getting less of a response than we'd like. It's harder so, to keep your uh, scapula in place. It's hard yeah, to because it yeah, once, we've all been there, right? Where the right, your right shoulder blade pops off. My, in my case, it's always my right, yeah. right? It pops off the side of the bench and you got two reps to go. And I'd almost, uh, in fact, I coach all my lifters rack, reset and take two more, save it for later, whatever, but don't just take two more reps without that because you've compromised the most important segment of this lift, which is how to stabilize the, the backside of your body. Yeah. And so if that got compromised, just quit. I mean, it, it's, you know, now your body Let going, go. you know, forget yeah. it, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. So I wanted to start us off talking about something, um, something like that, but, um, let's back up a little bit and yeah. give people maybe, uh, a good reason to, to listen to why yeah I thought uh, about that saying, right, yeah saying that what you've got to say right um, so Jake Noel as we said in the beginning um, what's your uh, background like athletic background professional education whatever you want to share yeah mm -hmm. so the most important thing about to know about me is uh, that I love my wife and children most so I'm a father of two and um, that is my first identity my meathead identity is as um, someone who has had a very broad background. And I have done competitive martial arts. I've done triathlons. I've done, um, I wouldn't call it CrossFit. Oh, I wouldn't call it CrossFit, <laughs> but it was sort of like CrossFit. Um, so definitely more conditioning oriented. Um, yeah. I've done uh, a little bit of rugby. I've done um, tons and tons of athletics. What this has amounted to though was an individual whose body was very confused and finally found its passion after many years of in being involved in activities that had very, that were almost, if I could call them, detrimental to success as a powerlifter. So, what I've had to do is, um, oh, and I've done bodybuilding. Yeah, I did some bodybuilding stuff when I was younger. Everybody did some bodybuilding stuff. When I was <laughs> Nineteen, you know? Yeah, right. Yeah. So, right. Um, so, but what it created was, so I had what I had was a body that um, had developed uh, imbalances and had developed. Um, I was injury prone. I still would, I would still identify myself as injury prone, uh, but found a passion for strength training. And, uh, as somebody who's passionate about getting stronger and, and 
because of his background, probably also combined with my genetics, as I have always said, my genetics have handed me no gifts. I have to do everything the hard way. Um, it's forced me to be uh, to develop a deeper understanding of how to keep myself healthy while getting stronger. Um, and so m- as a power lifter who was injury prone, um, and also I was, I've been a personal trainer since I was 19, um, so for 10 years now. And as that individual, I had a unique conundrum in front of me, which was how to stay healthy. That was my number one hurdle when it came to getting stronger. Most good programming worked well for me, but I always ended up with issues. So I had to find an approach that allowed me to um, keep myself healthy and compete in the sport I loved. That led me down the road of that, along with seeing my clients wrestling with immobility, wrestling with poor neural patterning, et cetera, led me down the road of becoming a licensed massage therapist, which is what I do now, um, alongside my training. So I do soft tissue therapy is what we call it because, um, we're not, we want to be sure that it's not confused with any kind of wind flutes or a, <laughs> like a relaxing environment or yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we definitely want to take care of folks, but we're, we're goal oriented in our therapeutic approach and yeah. the organization. Has. The goal is to keep you on the game train. Um, so with that said, that's kind of how I got to where I am today. I was training tons of people who had issues. I had issues and I had a passion for, for a barbell and it, I guess I reconciled one day the idea that, you know, it was going to take a little more than hard work for me to be able to stay in the sport, stay healthy and stay doing what I love to do. I was going to have to more than just want to, to get stronger and work hard because I was willing to do that. I, I was going to have to get smarter. And so I just really committed to outthinking my problems, you know, I was like, I, I think I could outthink this. I just need to have a, a fuller, richer understanding of the system I'm working with. In that case, it was my body. Um, I need to have a richer understanding of good training practices and good training science. What we've talked about a richer understanding of the psychological mechanisms, et cetera, but, um, that, or that get people excited about lifting and keep them connected to programs. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just get a richer understanding of all of that. And I think it led me to having a, a special ability to operate as a kinesiologist, a soft tissue therapist, somebody who understands. I also don't want to be um, 55 and like super screwed up. Uh, like, <laughs> right. uh, you know what I mean? I want right, to, yeah. even if I could suffer through a lot, I'd rather, rather be not. sure that I'm going to enjoy my grandchildren. Uh, yeah. Even though that's not the, the sexiest idea out there for some people right now who have had injuries on and off for five years. That's, that makes sense. <laughs> it's like, well, shoot, man, I don't like, want to screw myself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and anybody who's dealt with extensive injury history, um, and starts to face that question with some seriousness, um, that becomes a much, uh, much more appealing goal yeah. uh, than, you know, I mean, if you're, uh, 19 years old and you've never had an injury, then, you, you know, I mean, yeah, who cares? Like, you're not even thinking about right. that. And that's fine. That's probably part of life's design. But, right. you know, uh, yeah, once you start dealing with stuff like that, it becomes a lot more attractive. Yeah, and it's super interesting for for who, at what point that, can, but almost everybody at some point, if they're really committed to a competitive endeavor in any, in any athletic endeavor whatsoever. I mean, I don't even know that I'd call powerlifting athletic per se. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a hoot, you know, uh, and it's, and it's definitely very technically challenging, you know, but so any individual out there who is, um, concerned with how to stay involved in something they love doing, um, but they're wrestling with injuries I have to say, like I said, stay on the gain train. Nothing boots you off the gain train, which is the gain train, right? Staying on right. Yeah. Nothing boots you off, um, like getting hurt. And it robs you of your zest. It, it robs you of your yeah. desire. It, um, you could even feel better and come back five weeks later and just not really want to lift anymore. You know, yeah. you, you know, it sucks and we've all been there. So anyway, yeah, I, I wanted my, um, professional, or at least at this point in my professional career, I would I would be very pleased to to know that I had helped some folks. Um, I don't have to be thought of per se as the greatest training scientist that ever existed, but if I could keep people health, healthy 
um, and enjoying their lifting and doing it in a way that allowed for progress and allowed for goal setting to be achieved and do all those things and keep you effectively pain free or at least as pain free as a, as a strong lifter can be. Yeah. Um, and then know that if you do decide to get out of that sport at some point, you're not just going to have nothing left. You know, you'll have hips, you'll have knees. You should, right, yeah. you should be really strong and healthy and feel awesome. I mean, that's what should happen. If hopefully, the, yeah. yeah, that should be the, the hopeful outcome. But for a lot of folks, because of injuries and other things, that's not the the full full um, story. So in any event, that was the goal. Game plan was um, I saw myself as somebody who needed this. I thought a lot of other people probably do too. And I've really immersed myself for now um, ten years in the field. Really three to five years of really interest in what to do for the mate for for lifters who are worrying about bench squat and deadlift you know the big three yeah. um and that was when i started my interest in powerlifting. yeah yeah so that's the game plan for me um my uh educational background is as a licensed massage therapist um i am instrument uh um instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization specialist which is, if anybody's seen the Graston or the, the tools that mm-hmm. you scrape mm-hmm. out the scar tissue and adhesions, um, and a corrective exercise specialist, um, and then a whole bunch of other little obscure certs and stuff. But I, I would say that sure. those are the ones that I use on the most daily basis. Well, and, and I've, I've watched you, you work for uh, a little while now. And, I mean, I'm, to be honest, a little bit uh, surprised that uh, you said it's been five years it seems like uh your abilities far exceed that um what i've noticed uh right off the bat is that your um your approach seems to be very integrative um like yeah you you know i think people when they hear corrective exercise they're thinking you know uh like the little uh flossing bands and yeah right you know stuff like that but i've seen you do what you do and that's not it no it's No, I mean, like on on the templates, there's sections called like the swollness, yeah. <laughs> which is where you rip well, up. It, the goal yeah. of that part is to rip up and hamstrings I, and lats, and right. because if those are weak points, they can't be. S- and, and I know that you w- we'll you see, will you include after. that stuff in there, mm-hmm. like the the uh, uh, I don't know the more sissy type of rehab sure, yeah. corrective stuff if that's warranted, but. The goal is always to get somebody back to full. Yeah, the, you know, and and there's there's steps in between there. Like you don't just go from one day using the little flossing bands and doing some external rotations to the next day right. you're back on the bench press. Right. You know, there's there's multiple steps and it it blends. You know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So the, and those the steps that you're describing are. Um, and, and by the way, when I say like on the template says the swollenness, that is the ther- that is a therapeutic section of the template. It is not sure. a it's not like a, oh well we'll let you do some arms and stuff at the end too. So you don't hate <laughs> this. It's it's a very important part of the template. In fact, I had to explain to um, a patient the other day like you can't skip this part. It's not right. <laughs> you, yeah. I need you to be doing. You but know, who in their right mind would want to skip the swollenness? Exactly. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, because it wasn't with a barbell, you know, and right. they were, yeah, but uh, exactly. How could you possibly want to skip that? But um, yeah, but because it, it was pull-ups, we all want to skip pull-ups, I understand. But right. um, yeah, pull-ups are a part of a therapeutic process if that's where you're at. The thing about it is, Mike, is we're talking about rehabilitating or preventing or whatever, right. impacting a body that is operating at a competitive level with heavy loads. So the therapeutic approach needs to reflect that. Yeah. In a therapeutic setting, we would identify it as activities of daily living. So we're trying to get a customer ba- or a customer patient back to comfortably performing activities of daily living. Our activities of daily living are heavy squats and bench and deadlift. So the therapeutic approach has to be extended to allowing us to perform our daily activities, which is uh, barbell work. You know. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. There's an integrative approach there. Um, if you would call it that, I don't know. It's to me, it's the only way to get it done. You know, it's not integrating anything. It's just well, working with what's available. Yeah. Yeah, and know. maybe that's another so a good, good, good way of saying, yeah, thinking. Right, you know, yeah. but yeah. the on one end of the spectrum, you've got your uh, what people think of as like normal and uninjured training, and then on the other end, uh, I'm hurt and I can't do that. You know? Right. So how do you uh, take somebody from hurt can't do that to you know back to normal? Um, and Although maybe never exactly the same. Yeah, yeah the scar yeah. tissue. The I scars mean, you, are real, Mike. You know, yeah, 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 I mean, yeah you like, might And you it. ended up in this place for a reason, you know, and, and you know, we've talked in the past um, about, you know, various lifters that we've had come in. And, you know, everybody who's been doing this for decades has had their share of dings Something, and stuff right. like that. Yeah. And some people 
uh, it goes away completely and they go back to what they were doing before. But then other people, um, like for instance, for me, uh, I don't do box squats anymore. Right. Uh, the risk to benefit just isn't there. You know, I've had SI injuries in the past and sitting on a box with a heavy load, it's just the, it doesn't feel good. Yeah. It's just sure. not going to happen. So we, I, I just don't do that, you know? Um, yeah, that, I would say that's part of the uh, integrating, you know, post injury back to yeah, exactly, function. right, absolutely. Um, a, a exercise selection is certainly a, a huge aspect. The um, the methodology or the approach is to identify where so a symptom is a flag, but it is often a victim more than a criminal. So my hip hurts is generally an indication that there's something in your body that's not, you know, so let's say the um, side of your hip hurts on the right side and we identify that uh, the muscle there, the glute medius, it, it has lots of trigger points and lots of knots and it's being restricted and it's not getting good blood flow and it's jacked up. Um, uh, your glute medius, in my view, is, is really a victim of circumstance. So it's really probably not your glute medius's fault that, that it hurts. It probably is relating to a different almost always. In fact, uh, Dr. Thompson, who's a, um, who was a mentor of mine ha would always say, uh, where it hurts, it ain't where it hurts. <laughs> it ain't always look elsewhere. We want to treat that area for symptom relief, but that's almost never what the problem is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's why what we, it's why it sounds like voodoo half the time where I'll, you know, uh, just the other day, in fact, that an individual who kept, um, uh, he was feeling his low back during his deadlifts, he wasn't, um, he was feeling his quads, which is arguably good, but he was feeling ex his quads exclusively. Um, he wasn't able to find his erectors well. He wasn't using his glutes and hamstrings pretty much at all. Um, and I mobilized his calves really hard because he wasn't able to get upright enough to feel his glutes and quads or his glutes and hamstrings. So he was bending over the top of it, firing up with his knee extenders, which are the quads and his low back was getting smashed. And we mobilized his calves three times and he could get more upright and fired through with his glutes, which sounds like craziness. <laughs> you know, you come in with right. a low back problem. Well, I spent five minutes on yeah. your low back and 45 minutes on your calves and you got to swear them out of my mind. You know what I mean? And it's like, unless you've been through it. Enough exactly. Times, and then yeah. it makes sense. Yeah. Something, something that's occurred to me with all of this is that injuries are not isolated. They don't happen. Um, You'd say, you know, your body takes an integrated approach yeah. to injuries, so right. why not take the integrated approach to healing? To healing, absolutely. It's, and it's, it's very rare that, you know, so like just one particular muscle group. Yeah, no, we want to... One particular us... muscle will break down on its own. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's usually a chain of events mm -hmm. that starts somewhere way far away from where that right. muscle broke down. And it's just the tiny... Yeah, it's just unfortunate a, luck that that little guy got the yeah <laughs> got the symptom. Luck right. of the draw that right. time, right. right? And that's why we say you should always assess from the eyebrows down. You know, look if if no matter what the the symptom is steers you, but it never defines the the process. Um, and that's an important point. It is a process, and especially for an individual, that's why I think you're seeing such an integrated scenario. Unlike most clinicians who um, see individuals and then have to kind of release them back into the wild. Hopefully to a coach that knows what they're doing, but almost never yeah. have I released somebody to a coach that knows what they're doing. Um, unless, of course, they're working with anybody at RTS. But I have to release them back. You know, in, my, in, in the scenario that I have, because I have a clinic alongside a gym, the process I've gotten to observe now for three years, a process of getting somebody, categorizing somebody as symptomatic, removing their symptoms, removing the dysfunction, integrating it back into great exercise, um, and almost always hitting a PR after uh, the rehab process. I mean, almost always within several weeks of kind of completing that, they're PRing everything again because there was an underlying cock block the whole time, you know? Yeah. And we've, it just happened to finally get bad enough that we had to address it, but we should have five weeks ago, and they would have PR'd their squad back then, you know, without, right. the, without the issue. So, yeah, so it, that's where that integrative approach comes from. And as someone who had a background in athletics that did not necessarily give me um, like I, I wasn't using my powerlifting muscles a lot in a lot of my other athletic endeavors. So I had huge imbalances and you know, when you're fighting your body, you're not able to fight the barbell. And that is why this is not only a way to, or an approach that includes repatterning, rebalancing the body. That's not simply 
therapeutic, it's also performance enhancement. It's not, they're not really, in my mind, separable, which is why my approach looks like I'm trying to achieve both at the same time, because I am, because it's the same thing. So, okay. so yeah. what you're saying is that what you're doing is cheating. Right, it's, yeah, exactly <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'm thinking hard about how to do it better, and, right. and, and, and so it's and cheating, cheating, right? Yeah, exactly. So right. Yeah, this yeah. Is, there seems to be an integrated theme here of cheating. <laughs> right, yeah, that's yeah. right. Just, <laughs> right. Constantly go back to the, cheating, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. the ancient Greeks where you right. weren't even allowed to train. Right. Yeah, exactly. Just show, just show up and how it works, right? Yeah. But, you know, honestly, um, you know, there, there obviously there is a theme here, and I, and, and I do see all of this work, like everything that we're doing is... is these are these are some of the fastest way to gain ways to gain is kind of Absolutely. you know working with qualified people. Mm -hmm. These are you know what I would call quote unquote shortcuts. Mm -hmm. You know getting getting yeah. your body serviced right and treated right. Absolutely, just kind of keeping it in prime shape. Learning how to properly use it. These are all shortcuts to getting stronger without actually literally getting stronger. Just right. getting better. Yeah, Be becoming a better lifter. Um, I mean, in terms of powerlifting, of course, being strong is a huge component of that, but. There's many other components, and it's not always it's not like we say. It's not the well, yeah. Yeah. it's not always the strongest guy that wins the meet. It's the the best, best power lifter. Right. Yes. Uh, which, I mean, we talk about attempt selection. You know, we talk about all this other stuff, but you know, technical perfection. Um, you know, putting yourself in in the right position to get stronger. Like that's all part of it as well. So that almost is like saying that you're an athlete. And <laughs> <laughs> almost, yeah. almost, you're getting close, right? right. Yeah. And I know you didn't say it. Yeah, no, no, I said athletic. it might not be. I haven't made any. <laughs> but uh, to yeah, me, no, being no, an athlete no. is more than just kind of brute, you know, kind of simplistic strength or simplistic sure. execution. There's, yeah. there's, it's the whole, it's the whole chess match. Oh, absolutely. No, it's if a I, mentality I, thing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, the ultimate objective at the end of the day is to coordinate the efforts of my body in such a format that I move more low than the last time I did this. That's the whole boat, right? Coordinate the efforts of every muscle in my body so that when I go to move this load, I can do more of it than last time I did it. That's the whole boat. And so if you are not skillfully coordinating your efforts or there is a neurological scenario that's preventing co that coordinated effort, solving that is a competitive edge, an enormous competitive edge. Solving that, in fact, is almost not negotiable. It's the only next step in my mind in many cases. If you want to be, especially as if you, you move to up in the ranks, Absolutely. if you want to be a high level competitor, if you want to be an athlete, that's, you need a team. You know, Absolutely, you need, yeah. You need people around you to help you find those strategic angles and that strategic edge. Yeah, absolutely. Now, before we move on from here, I've got another question to ask you, but just to kind of give a little bit of background on this question. Um, first of all, we have uh, an RTS seminar coming up in November. Yep. Um, it's going to be in Brooklyn at Polly's Gym, uh, the South Brooklyn Weightlifting Club. Um, this is going to be very different from seminars that we've done in the past. Uh, Friday, there will be kind of a, a little meet and greet, uh, pretty pretty relaxed uh, setting. Uh, we're going to do some training. We're all going to sling some weights together. That'll be fun. Uh, Saturday, we're going to get into programming, but instead of talking so much about like esoteric principles and stuff like that, that end up leading people to overcomplicate things and uh, just end up being really hard to apply. Sometimes create more questions than answers. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we're going to we're going to approach it a little bit differently. We're going to uh, give people a bunch of free programs. And we're going to teach by example. Right. Uh, that's something that's always been very illuminating for me. So here you look at this. Uh, this is how it's structured. Here's why it's structured this way. Uh, so you can kind of learn by example. Um, and those will be, you know, yours to keep. Uh, you can take them with you. You can do them. Uh, you can modify them, whatever you want. Uh, and hopefully there's a lot, a lot to be learned on Saturday. And then on Sunday, uh, that's going to be like our special VIP day. Um, we're going to, we have a limited number of spots. I think 15 spots is what we said. Then we're going to break people down into groups of no more than three lifters. Um, you will go to uh, five different stations. Uh, of course, one station for each of the three power lifts, uh, another station on programming, and then a third station, or a fifth station rather, uh, with Jake on this sort of thing that we're talking about now, correctives, but like a really more integrated approach to keeping a lifter healthy long-term. Uh, so that's, that's our VIP day. 
And the goal there is that you walk out with a training, pro a training program uh, that's custom designed to fit you and your needs for the next five to six months. Uh, you walk out with uh, specifically tailored, you know, uh, very individualized coaching uh, technical instruction uh, on each of the three power lifts. Uh, you know what your weaknesses are, your weak ranges of motion, um, and all that stuff is integrated into your training plan. And you also have a correctives, uh, for lack of a better term, correctives, GPP sort of program available to you that you can take with you and make sure that you stay healthy through the course of this program. Anyway, so this, this is our seminar that's coming up. Um, you can uh, get tickets to that on the RTS uh, website and go to the shopping cart in the custom solutions section, you can get either you know standard tickets or VIP tickets. Um, anyway, um, kind of getting a little long-winded about our seminar. Kind of excited about it. It's going to be it's going to be cool. Just that it's a different way to to go about teaching these sorts of topics. Um, what I wanted to ask you about it, though, so you've got um, you've got a, a lecture that will be on the Saturday yep. and also uh, you're managing one of the stations on Sunday the VIP day um, I'm assuming a little bit that you're going to be talking about repatterning which is a topic that right. you and I have talked about a little bit um, and we we're running out of time a little bit so it's a little bit of a teaser but I want you to get into uh, like what is repatterning and let's just talk about it a little bit yeah and uh, if people want to know more about that then I really encourage them to come to the seminar yeah and you something you hadn't uh, covered about the seminar when do we eat at the <laughs> seminar because it sounded like a lot of lifting but not a lot of eating well, well, don't worry the, the, food, <laughs> right, right. the food's covered it'll be plenty of that okay yeah, yeah. Coach, coach Paul's got yeah, that locked down right, I'm okay. looking out for food all right right food yeah, will okay. be covered all right, definitely making sure that gets handled so <laughs> with that in mind I think we can move forward with the question you asked um so here's the con the principle of repatterning is a terminology that I pulled out of my ass uh, because <laughs> I think there's a it, there's a lot of really in depth scientific concepts to, that come alongside that and I thought repatterning just sort of summed it all up. What it effectively means is what we're repatterning is is mostly the nervous system. So we're making sure that neurologically. Um, Neurologically, it, it's also called like neural timing or neural sequence. So we want to ensure that the, the proper st stability mechanisms are in place for your body um, so that, well, and, and that they are firing first so that stability is created before we ask for movement out of your body. That is, ha I mean, you're not going to, if there were no stability, you just wouldn't move. You, no stability would be like a bowl of jello, you know. Um, but there can be pretty obvious and relatively easy to fix um, weak points in the stability mechanisms of the body. That's kind of step one to repatterning is figuring out, and it's a whole subsystem of muscles that are not lats and are not pecs, but they're things like the um, rotatories and the, you know, I mean, these little weird muscles that nobody cares about. I don't even care about them to be in, in terms of, <laughs> I mean, in terms of the punchline for these kinds of, you know, sure. it doesn't matter what they're called. It doesn't really hardly even matter where they are. What matters is that your body knows how to use them to create good stability. From there, we want to ensure something as simple as, um, let's just go with our bench press example, which began the pod podcast. Um, if my lats are not firing hard before I go to press the barbell, I am softening the, the stabilizing mechanism of my bench press. Um, and it sounds like I'll, all I care about is bench press with this podcast, but um, it's probably my favorite because this is America. But I don't know that, um, or I would say certainly that's not the only thing that this applies to. It just serves as a nice example today. Um, if I haven't created good stability before I'm going to move the barbell, as an example, I have a performance restriction. So I have a platform that I'm pushing off of that is not as sturdy as it could be. Um, when you were when you all were saying you know you didn't actually get stronger I, if i could rephrase i would say you didn't muscularly right create a muscular strength but you created an intramuscular strength so you taught your muscles how to talk to each other better the system as a to, whole is better. is performing better yeah. because it's working synergistically it's all firing at the same time right. in the same order or in the right order to produce the most amount of force that is a deliberate effort. That is a competitive effort if it's done by a competitive individual. Um, and it is, um, it is a skilled effort. And it's to me what the skill, the nuts and bolts of lifting is, is knowing how to make sure that my body 
is well positioned, firing the correct musculature and setting me up for not only the biggest lift, but also um, simultaneously the safest lift. Um, the one that, that allows me to train at the highest level with the least amount of risk. Those are, that's kind of what repatterning means, I suppose. It means teaching my nervous system how to position itself so that I'm not misfiring nothing. All cylinders going off at the right time. It's an ethereal concept more than a real thing because you can't ever really get there, but you're, you're getting as close to that as you can. And this is different from just simple technique work. It, well, it is. Technique work is going to be thought of, we're chiefly looking at technique work from a structural viewpoint. So is everything aligned where it belongs? The underlying principle that I'm talking about is, is the neural environment correct? And that can't be really per se observed. Um, we've seen it. You, you know that when we say, oh, crisp. Yeah. Oh, that was crisp. That's that great timing. Everything went off at the right time. Everything was in the right position and everything fired well. That's certainly at first, it's a technical thing first. So technically, let's understand our mechanics of the movement. It's deeper than technique. Again. Yeah, but then we're going to go one layer deeper if that's not cutting it. Or even sure. if it is cutting it, but you just want a competitive edge. Sure. Uh, you want an advantage. So yeah, the next step is now neurologically, what order are things firing in? Why are they firing in that order? And how do I fix fix potential issues there? Um, so you know, an example would be like on the bench press. Um, if my lats don't fire before I go to press the barbell and pushing off of a weaker platform. Um, if my low back, my my uh, sacrum SI joints don't stabilize before I go to deadlift, then I'm not going to get a good connection to my glutes and hamstrings. Yeah. So those are things that we all know, but what to do when the structures look like they're all there, but we're not getting the right neural response there. And that's where you have to come in with a little bit of a more therapeutic approach, I guess I would call it. Sure. But again, like you, like we had said, and then use that to bring you back into great barbell lifts. Sure. Yeah. For a time, for a time with my approach would indicate for certainly an injured athlete, but maybe for an athlete that's also looking just to get to the next level, I would say for a time we're actually going to allow ourselves to um, reduce and sacrifice um, energy toward the big three on the basis that when we go back to them, we will come back renewed and smash huge loads. Yeah. Um, yeah, if that makes sense. So yeah, so that's kind of like, unlike just great technique coaching, which is what to do with the barbell, how to position your body, get tight and push. This is more like, let's get, uh, that, that stimulus isn't cutting it for you. Let's go back a step or two. Um, we need to get to a layer of the body and of the nervous system that is not addressed in that just via technique coaching. That layer right. has to be addressed via modality selection via, um, I like what you, what you mentioned about, um, a, list, a lift being crisp you know? yeah. and, and we see that a lot. Like if you watch a video of. Um, one of my favorites is is Mike Bridges uh, squat like it's just it's not just technical perfection because his technique is is flawless mm -hmm. uh, or, or watch Andrew Believ do a, a deadlift mm -hmm. um, it's there's something more than just technical perfection it's a refinement yep. of a movement pattern yep. it's it's the kind of an overall mastery yeah the transfer of force is is completely uninhibited and you can see it. Yeah. When that individual pushes through their feet and stands their chest up and off of a deadlift and you know, you can observe the transfer of force with no hiccups. It's yeah. just a perfect smooth transfer of force straight up. That is that means that now you're free to just get muscularly more strong because you're you're hitting everything with the right transfer of force. As initially maybe you get let's say you get five of those a week. I don't know, I'm just picking a random number. You get five great reps a week. You can do some repatterning and get seven or nine, seven to nine great reps a week. You do that a little bit more and you get 15 great reps a week. And before you know it, over half of them are just as crit, you know, just, just picture it. That's a hell of a training system. <laughs> that's like, right. yeah, this feels good. Yeah. It makes it right. Being, being, right. being kind of patterned properly, having everything firing in the right sequence in the right order and the right time will once again allow you to train more efficiently, mm -hmm. stay healthy and get stronger. Mm -hmm. And keep your joint mechanics from being compromised um, from a health standpoint, but also allow them to, the control is just through the roof when, when that's happening. Yeah. So what you're talking about then with uh, repatterning essentially is that it's um, a way of developing that ability. It's a way of uh, moving somebody toward that um, 
not just good technique, but just really technical mastery. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hopefully a little bit faster. Like I've got a, I've got a, I think it's a great video on our YouTube channel um, of me doing a squat at like a six year training age versus a squat at a 16 year training age. Right. Now six years of training is not insignificant. Like you've been at yeah, it for you've a been while. on your grind, right? Uh, but to watch side by side a lifter at six years versus 16 years. And then to see a difference there at me at 16 years versus somebody else, you know, uh, let's keep with Mike Bridges, for right. example, um, at however long that he's been doing it, you know, it, there's always more to be done, I right. guess, in terms of technical mastery. And it's not just about having your, your like major limbs in pretty much the right position. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. And more than a shortcut, it's, I would call it a, a direct road. Yeah. yeah. A direct yeah. road to what you actually need to be accomplishing over the course of the next 30 years. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. can you, um, just to, to get a little bit more practical here, um, as we're wrapping up, yep. can you shed some light on what might uh, repatterning work look like? Yeah, I will. And that's going to, in the, at the seminar, we're going to go over the lecture is a, is a really pretty in-depth understanding of that. So, um, it would take so far, I think it takes an hour to explain it pretty well. So I'll give you the, yeah. <laughs> so I will give you a, um, yeah, like I said, the, the when we're talking, version yeah, I read the two minute version of that. Um, what it affects, so we have to, uh, one term that is helpful to this. So we've talked about creating advantaged mechanics. Um, now we have to talk about one more term, which I have termed neural buzz, which is there's a basic, your nervous system has a basic buzz that it's sending to muscles all over your body, telling them what length to be at. Okay. Yeah, so like resting tone. Yes, exactly. Resting tonicity and those. Yep. So, um, that neural buzz is more or less subconscious. Yeah. It can be overridden by the conscious, sure. but it's operating subconsciously, whether you're there or not. Now, uh, let's say that you're wanting to squat. Your neural buzz is telling your, your hip flexors to fire too much. And it has now created that neural buzz went to the extent that it's beyond just uh, something you're trying to outsmart. And now it's like, I just can't control this. It's the, the mechanism has uh, spun out of control. You know? Yeah. Um, the first thing we look to do is take that. We first we want to figure out what is it about by understanding symptoms, by looking at training footage, by any other number of factors. Um, and certainly at the seminar by looking at people in person, which I'm really excited about. Um, taking, taking that in person and taking those symptoms and gathering all the information we can and saying, okay, our best, our, our, with what we understand now, it's most likely that this muscle is firing too hard or too often or too early. Those yeah. are kind of the three. It's either got too much, too frequently or too soon. Um, so we need to inhibit that. We need to create that. Um, and this is where we'll go into stretching in the seminar. You can static stretch to weaken things on purpose as an advantage. Um, so a lot of that static stretching that's gotten a bad rap, mm -hmm. that might be a good idea if that muscle is too, too active, weaken right. it. So you can't use it. Um, good idea. Right. Yeah. So in any event, we might weaken that muscle intentionally in a, in a, a thoughtful way, um, or inhibit it or mobilize it. So create a mechanic that wasn't available to you before. Um, then we want to activate musculature that's underactive. So create, so let's say in this case, we would recognize it as an oblique or a glute, um, or usually both. Um, but let's say for this argument, we went with oblique. So we're going to fire that oblique through a corrective approach. And that's where the wussy band stuff shows up because the goal is to stimulate something, not to train it per se, if that makes sense. We're trying mm -hmm. to just get some, some neural talk happening to that musculature. And then we want to go integrate that into the mechanic, into the movement that we're repatterning at any given time. So, just shift the patterning away from, so my neural buzz is telling my hip flexor to fire. I'm gonna insert a mobilization or an inhibition to turn that down or as close to off as I can get it. I'm gonna activate the muscle. The reason why it was firing in the first place was because some other jerk wasn't doing his job. That's the oblique in this case. I'm gonna give him some stimulus that says, wake up, turn on, do your job. And then I'm gonna go squat. In this case, I'm with lower loads, that depends on how symptomatic a person, if they're very, very symptomatic, the loads are sometimes 20%. Um, if they're not very symptomatic, the loads can be as far, as high as 80%, 83%. You can work up to one in an eight, one in a nine with a corrective happening right before. Yeah. If, if there's no reason not to. Yeah. We talked about that happening with your bench press. Absolutely. Yeah. I PR my bench after cause my shoulder hurt. So I was like, I don't want to 
screw up my shoulder, let's fix it. And then, and now I can't seem to keep the bench from flying off my chest. It was kind of funny. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> thing just won't stay down. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Good problem. So yeah, it's a good problem, exactly. So um, again, that's what I was saying, you know, sometimes we can PR stuff yeah. just by bringing some bounce back. So on a practical level, what it looks like is getting some, so I don't believe in super tons of mobilization. I just happen to be a cat who probably genetically is really tight. I have long limbs and a short torso. It creates some mechanical disadvantage that creates tightness over time. If I don't mobilize pretty frequently, I can't perform the mechanic that I'm trying to perform. It happens to be the reality of my body. Um, that is fine. So if I go mobilize smartly up to the point that I need, but not one bit further, well, I shouldn't say that, 10% further is what I say. That way, if your form's yeah. off 10%, you don't get hurt. So be 10% more mobile than you have to be so that if you move 10% out of position, you don't get injured. Um, create the mechanic that you're looking to create, activate the muscles that aren't activating, and then integrate them into your movements. And over the course of approximately nine workouts, you can repattern just about anything that way. As long as you, as long as we select the right, yeah. you know, as long as we, we thought it was the hip flexor, it was the hip flexor, it wasn't anything else, it was just that, and, and we're ready to rock it. We're ready to rock and roll. Um, that's not exactly common. And again, that's why I was saying it's kind of like your goal is to get there one day maybe, but it's not really something you ever get to. It's just something you get closer to all the time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, so we identified that it was the hip flexor. This isn't, um, uh, Paul, like you were saying, it's we're not talking about a thing. We're talking about the eyebrows down. So there are repercussions for tightnesses in your body that go throughout the whole matrix. Um, sure. So yeah, we found the criminal, we, we turned the criminal off and we activated that slouch that wasn't doing his job. Um, and we integrated it back into movement pattern. And if you stay on that for a while, you can eventually get to a point where your nervous system has, has rewired. What I described by the way, is not my content. It's t classic therapeutic content. It's mm -hmm. national Academy of sports medicine, uh, 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 per, uh, physical, what am I trying to say? Physical therapist, NAPTA, North American yeah. Physical Therapist Association. Yeah. Um, you know, those organizations have this kind of, these kind of protocols written out. They've just had a, a, a tough go at applying it to people who are, who are getting down, you know, yeah. um, they've had an easy time applying these thought processes to little old ladies and stuff, but they've had a challenge with giving it, giving that over to the, to the strength world and having it be very effective. Um, and, and my approach uh, is very aggressive. In fact, we do, we'll do seven or eight sets of repatterning. Um, so let's say we identify an imbalance in internal rotation of the shoulder. We're going to stretch and stretch and stretch seven times before your bench press. I mean, it's almost impossible to not, <laughs> to not something's going to tell you, know, yeah, it's almost, yeah. So, um, uh, that would be way more aggressive than, than most therapeutic, um, scenarios would recommend, but I'm working with way more aggressive athletes than most therapeutic scenarios. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So, yeah. um, any anyway, yeah, that's what it looks like on a practical level, getting rid of those muscles that are, that are beating you up and causing all the problems, getting some tension out of there, breaking those spasm cycles, um, uh, stretching and mobilizing where the mechanics are flawed. Um, and then activating some of that musculature that you're trying to turn back on, um, mm -hmm. whether it's turned off or it's just not getting great pattern or signaling, um, firing that puppy back up and then integrating that into the, into one of the big three in this, in the case of a power lifter, you know, this approach would work well for other athletes as well, but we're talking about power lifters, but oh uh, yeah. And then integrating it into one of your big threes and just doing that, um, under the context of making sure that you're doing it with pain levels that are. Um, what we say a three out of a 10, 10 is more pain than you want. It's not the most pain ever. So a three out of 10 is a very mild pain threshold that I ask people to operate inside. So right. yeah, thoughtful of the pain threshold, uh, res restricting the muscles that are too tight, uh, or, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, inhibiting the muscles that are too tight and that are being restrictive, and then firing up and repatterning uh, the muscles that are underactive, and then putting it into your lift. Yep. Okay. That awesome. explains the process. Yeah, <laughs> like I said, yeah, it's kind of... Yeah, I mean, uh, like we said in the beginning... It's like rocket kinda... science, basically. It's no big deal, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but it is actually only a three-step thing, yeah. Yeah, it's a two-minute drill version of, of what you've got going on. And yeah. like you mentioned, uh, the seminar in Brooklyn uh, no, in November, we'll get into a lot more depth on that. So, um, Yeah, and for our VIPs, uh, they not only get to get the, the knowledge there, but also really what would that look like for their, their needs. Yeah, and I what think does that mean be... to me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And so, yeah, I think our VIPs are going to be really lucky this year to get to have not only – terrific coaching on their primaries, but also, um, hopefully yeah. I can add something good to the conversation about yeah. how to stay healthy. You know? No, it's going to be, it's going to be really cool. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to it. I know all of us are. 
Um, anyway, I don't. I know we could go, go on, on talking for, 10, yep, exactly. uh, for a long time, go on yeah. until the seminar, but uh, that's all the time we've got. So, um, yeah, just thanks for coming out. Uh, thanks for uh, being on the podcast with us. Uh, thanks, Polly, for um, being so on here with us as out. well. Yeah, happy to help. Yeah. So, um, what do you guys say? So, I, I didn't really introduce us very well. We're uh, we're here at. Uh, in Denver uh, at Masters World. So I think we're going to wrap this up. We're going to go downstairs and watch some lifting. Uh, everybody, thanks for watching. If you want to come to the seminar, um, you can head over to the RTS website, go to the shopping cart in the custom solutions category. Uh, you can get your tickets over there. So, um, yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, thanks for uh, listening to the podcast. Uh, we'll see you next time.